from the former Groot Krokodil to the former mother of the nation. Last year, South Africa was riveted by the evidence that emerged in the Truth Commission's hearings into the activities of Winnie Mandela's Mandela United Football Club in Soweto during the 1980s. This week, a second round of hearings relating to Winnie Marikizela Mandela took place. This time, the Commission wanted to establish what the relationship was between the Soweto Security Police and Marikizela Mandela. But let's take the story from the beginning. For nine days last year, one witness after another appeared before the Truth Commission in Mayfair and pointed an accusing finger in Winnie Madikizela Mandela's direction. The allegations range from personal beatings by Mandela to tales of abduction and eight brutal murders. One of South Africa's most respected anti-apartheid activists referred to the general reign of terror by Mandela United Football Club in Soweto during the 1980s. The football club often dispensed their frightening brand of justice which included vicious assaults in cases ranging from domestic disputes to those who crossed their paths and were branded as informers. It was widely spoken about in the community that Mrs. Mandela often directed these operations. Some of the most damaging testimony against Marikizela Mandela, however, came from the distraught families of the two boys who disappeared during the 80s. Both families hold Winnie Mandela responsible. I've already mentioned that she was present. And she went away with him. What else must I say? Mandela, however, remained unruffled throughout the two weeks of unrelenting testimony against her. She dismissed all the allegations by every single witness and finally suggested that the hearings were part of a political plot against her. The unhealthy coincidence in my mind that this must happen a few days before the national conference to me suggests it is part and parcel of that agenda. A whole lot of other things which are not necessarily connected to this Truth Commission. Finally, however, she responded to an emotional appeal from Archbishop Desmond Tutu and gave a form of apology. And you don't know how your greatness would be enhanced if you were to say sorry. Things went wrong. I am saying it is true. Things went horribly wrong. A little more than a week after the hearings, Marikizela Mandela's bid to become the ANC deputy president at the organization's national conference failed. After months of manoeuvring and counter-manoeuvring, beleaguered ANC Women's League president Winnie Marikizela Mandela has finally been forced to give up on her bid for the ANC's deputy presidency. This followed a unanimous decision by the party's 50th national conference to raise the percentage of support required for nominations from the floor from 10 to 25 percent. Ivor Powell reports. The drama unfolds at the ANC's 50th national conference as this ordinary delegate moves across the stage to nominate her candidate for the deputy presidency. Thank you. Uh, for deputy president, I don't make for red notes, I'm going to sell my But when the chips are down, only 125 hands are raised in support of the nomination. This leaves Madikizela Mandela with only 15% of the votes needed to earn the right to contest the deputy presidency against the leadership's favoured candidate, KwaZulu-Natal leader Jacob Zuma. This year, her relationship with the Truth Commission again made headlines when she met with the controversial American leader of the Nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan. The oppressed in the, the uh, scheme of reconciliation must not bear the burden of such uh, horror, I would say, as the nine days that uh, Mrs. Mandela went through and Mr. Botha can thumb his nose at such truth and reconciliation. Last year's marathon hearing into the Mandela Football Club brought some relief to victims like the Sorno family and probably also contributed to the demise of Marikizela Mandela's immediate political ambitions. 
but the hearing did not answer many questions. Instead, it raised a whole lot of new ones. Like what exactly was the relationship between Winnie and the Soweto security police? It was with this in mind that the Truth Commission held a second round of hearings this week and subpoenaed policemen from the former Soweto security branch. Winnie Matikizela Mandela did not attend this week's hearing, but her presence dominated the proceedings and the testimony of the former Soweto security policemen. Nice t-shirt for Winnie Mandela, 25 rand each. What was interesting for us was to find out, with all these allegations going on around the activities of Mandela United Football Club, what did the security branch know about all this? Because we are aware that there was surveillance by them and they have admitted that they had a telephone tap, for example, on Mrs. Madikizela Mandela's house. We know for a fact now, on his own admission, that Mr. Jerry Richardson was an informer. So we needed to determine what the security branch knew about the matters and what they did about all the other allegations that we've heard about. The men who were responsible for surveilling Medigazella Mandela, for searching her house, tapping her phone, harassing and arresting her, spoke with awe of the woman who once ruled Soweto. She was untouchable. Mrs. Mandela was not the kind of person whom you visited upon a brainwave and upset her whole household and see if I could arrest her. That would have meant the end of my career at that stage. I also reached the, always reached the conclusion that the people were afraid of her. She is a very strong person, let us make no mistake, a friend of mine. And perhaps in light of it, I could say this, that one could throw her from a height of 30,000 feet from an aeroplane and nothing will happen to her. Beyond these ironic compliments from the policemen, they remained evasive in answering almost all the other questions put to them. Can you give us a reason why your policemen did not act regarding the abduction of either the four youths from the manse or of the two youths, Lolo Sono and Siboniso Shabalala, timelessly? Can you give us a reason? In that case, it is negligence on the side of the public who knew but who didn't inform the police and who on purpose withheld the information. Crucial questions the commission had lined up for the policemen included how many of the Mandela United Football Club members were police informers and what relationship Winnie had with the cops. The mystery of why Winnie was never prosecuted or questioned for crimes the police claimed they had evidence of. There were activities taking place in the home of Mrs. Mandela which could either lead to um, an investigation of Mrs. Mandela, her own involvement possibly in these activities, but nothing happened at the level of the police. And I'm putting it to uh, Mr. Kritzinger that they wanted the situation to carry on where the Mandela Football Club or members of it continued participating in criminal activity. So I would like to deny this categorically. I think that the security branch and especially the investigating unit, for which I am proud to have been a member, did everything in its ability to protect the community of Soweto and the investigations we launched regarding Mrs. Mandela. I think that this is a story that has been repeatedly mentioned. That I want, I want to mention again that she was not a person simply to be approached. One must take into consideration that at that stage she was the wife of President Mandela. It was just a matter of you could just not approach her. The other view of course is that and I would like to understand, get from you, I, didn't, I don't say you said this. The other theory that is um, associated with absence of action by the security police is that Mrs. Matikizela Mandela herself was working with the security police. What's your views? What are your views in that regard? If you want my personal opinion, then I would say that I deny this categorically. I cannot believe it to be true. Between all the denials and evasive tactics, some new facts and corroborations of earlier evidence did emerge. 
Winnie Mandela has always claimed that she was out of town when child activist Stompy Sepe was brutally beaten at her deep clue of home. This week, former security policeman Daniel Bosman said the bug on her telephone revealed that Winnie Mandela had in fact been at home that fateful weekend, once again casting doubt on her Brantford alibi. Do you recall, because it was of great national importance at the time, it was all over the newspapers and so forth, whether information was passed over to the security branch relating to telephone conversations by Mrs. Mandela at her house at the end of December 1988 and the beginning of January 1989. On those specific days, she alleged that she was at Brantford, but we did pick up her voice, and this was all passed on to the murder and robbery unit Soweto. You have told us that you re recorded telephone conversations uh, which indicated or clearly showed that Mrs. Mandela was present during uh, the time period where she says that she was in Brantford around the Stompy case. Were you surprised that this information was never used? in terms of the prosecution against Mrs. Mandela? I can just say that at one stage they said that the information was too sensitive to use. They did not want to make the information public. And where do you personally rest the responsibility for nothing happening in this regard? If the Attorney General refused to prosecute, then nobody could could have done anything. We were powerless. We didn't know what to do. Can I read from your statement that it is possible for us to go and obtain the transcript you are talking about? At this stage, I think it's impossible. I think everything has been destroyed by now. We... Last year, former Mandela United football coach and the convicted killer of Stompy Sepe, Jerry Richardson, created a sensation when he confessed to being a police spy at the first round of the Truth Commission hearings. This week, the security policeman confirmed this, but said Richardson was the only informer they had in the Mandela household. Throughout the two days of the police testimony, the families of the disappeared Soweto youngster Lolo Sono sat in the audience. So too did the mother of Stompy Sepe. This time, they were joined by the family of murdered Ascari, Johannes Temba Mapota, who, it was claimed, was Winnie's lover. The former commander of Flakplas, Eugene de Kock, who described Winnie as a thorn in the flesh of the security forces, gave a chilling account of how he later murdered her alleged lover. He told the TRC Temba Mapota had been handed over to Flakplas by this man, former police colonel Jan Potgieter. When Mabota turned around, I shot him two shots in, into his heart after each other. Then his clothing was removed, his hands were untied, and he was placed on top of the dynamite, the, the explosives. I then walked off because exploding bodies was not in my line. Decision to eliminate Ma Temba Mabote. Who made that decision? I wouldn't say Jan Portreta took the decision. I believe it came from his commanders, and if he did that, he would have had very good reasons for that. That was one of the dark sides of the guerrilla war, and I would like to mention that any war that is being fought in the shadows is very rude, dirty. dirty. We must make no f mistake about that. The Commission has now spent 11 very long days probing all the different angles around the Mandela United Football Club and Winnie Marikizela Mandela. But so many questions remain in the air. Was Temba Mobota killed to protect Winnie and her relationship with the police? Why are the policemen still so evasive about a woman they clearly saw as a terrorist? Why was Attorney General Klaus von Liras not called to explain why Winnie Medigizela Mandela was given special treatment? But most critically, why did the police never follow up on the cases of the two missing youths, Lolo Sono and Sibunisa Shabalala? Why do the families of these two boys still have nothing to go on except their own suspicions?